I think you're reading my mind. So let's talk about culture. Let's talk about culture. Yeah, that would be mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so part of a struggle is not just being, you know, uh, reading Marx or reading uh, what's going on with capital and capitalism, but part of it is to establish ideas or groundworks for the future that what kind of society we want. And that comes from culture and establishing a new grounds for culture. Can you talk about culture right now and, and, and how we see it? I can, although we might have a slightly different position on that. I'm, you're very optimistic about what culture, what culture can do. Um, uh, and I have had years where I'm optimistic and years when I'm, when I'm less optimistic. I'm actually not sure of culture's capacity to envision uh, a future world, so much as I, I think culture is uh, quite capable of expressing the contradictions and strangenesses of uh, our present world and the world that, that we've inherited. And I'm not sure culture should be envisioning a future world. I think that it's very hard to imagine what uh, the world would look like after a radical break from capitalism because our consciousnesses themselves are so structured by capitalism. I'm very interested to find out what our imaginations will be like uh, on the other side of that break. You know, there's this famous debate in the 1950s, 60s in France between the surre Surrealists and the Situations International. Uh, and Guy Debord says, well, you want to put revolution in the service of poetry. Uh, excuse me, I've got that backwards. Uh, you want to put uh, poetry in the service of revolution. He's talking to the, to the Surrealists. Uh, and of course, that's a wonderful, noble idea that poetry can somehow serve as part of the struggle and, and engender greater militancy for people. But Debord says, I want to put revolution in the service of poetry. I think poetry can't be truly free until we've had a revolution. We won't even know what poetry can be until that time. And that's the position I take. I, I am still a practicing poet, somewhat um, ambiguously, uh, but my real ambition is to see what poetry will look like when we're able to think about poetry and make it from a position outside of capitalism. But, but how could we wait to then to come up with a new poetry? Uh, we, have no, we have no choice. I think that's the argument. I mean, if you take, if you take uh, Marx's argument seriously, that our, that our forms of consciousness uh, emerge from the material conditions in which we live, all poetry written now is capitalist poetry. That doesn't mean it's pro-capitalist poetry. And of course, much of it isn't. Poets are often quite sensible in their opposition to uh, that, those kinds of shackles. Uh, but it still is imagined from within a context of capitalism. And so it still is capitalist poetry in that sense. And a post-capitalist poetry would be that because it's imagined not within uh, capitalism. So uh, I do take that proposition quite seriously, which is not to say that we shouldn't be pursuing poetry now. I think we should, in part because uh, I take an almost mystical satisfaction from poetry's strangeness and its strange beauty, and that satisfaction is important to me, and I want to preserve it. Uh, but I don't think that poetry is a satisfactory revolutionary force. And the thing I've been saying for several years now is, listen, it's a good time for poets to get out in the streets and struggle, and it will make their poetry better. Don't figure out what kind of poetry you can write to make the world better. Get out in the streets and struggle and your poetry will change for it. And that's, I want to keep saying that. Oh, that's wonderful, beautiful. And then, um, what's your opinion about spoken words and rap and not that you mentioned poetry, but uh, I'm interested to get your I inputs on uh, spoken words and especially rap and rap music now. Well, rap music has historically been extremely important to me. My honors thesis when I was an undergraduate was about rap music and poetry. My uh, master's project was about contemporary poetry and hip hop. Uh, so it's been something that's been, that's been very important to me. I think that, uh, you know, Chuck D referred to hip hop as black people CNN quite some time ago. And at its best, it it can be something like that. I think that it assumes a certain level of militancy. Sometimes, of course, it's posturing, as if we don't all posture all the time in our poetry and our, and our movies and our plays and whatever. Uh, so some of it is, of course, posturing. But the baseline assumption of a level of militancy and a level of struggle in it is, uh, to me, very moving. And I simply hope it will become increasingly antagonistic and militant. And you have written few books of poetry 
Yeah. I, and I did ask if, if it was possible for you to read one or two of your poems today. And I regret to say that I've agreed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be nice. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm prepared to give it a, give it a go. Please. If All right, so I'm going to set, set this little thing up. Um, I'm going to see, see where I can set it, because I can actually set this so I can read it scrolling. Um, let's see where we can do it. So yeah, that should actually work. Uh, oh yeah, that's great. So just tell me when you want me to start the, I have, yeah, I have two, is that okay? Two? Oh, I'm All right. For the, yeah. Okay, Long, a longer one and a shorter one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the first one. So this is called Poem Ending in a Line from Lorene Niedeker. She's a Wisconsin poet uh, who I greatly admire and I took a line from uh, one of her works in this. I keep my mind under my arm where I hold my head when I walk, when I walk down to market, when I walk down to the market, the actions are social, but the mind is private. When I walk down, walk down to the inferno, the mind is private. I had a vision, the mind is privately held under my arm when I walk, I, had a dream, had a Baudelaire, had a Rambo. The action is social, but Apollinaire walks. He promenades down to market, promenades in the market, walks out, walks home, walks through streets named after market towns. The names are social, but the century is private. The inferno is social, but the mind follows the head, thinks we can leave, thinks we can go down to the market and leave, just leave, thinks we can be in it, but not of it. You know all too well that the best poetry is not the least revolution. You know also that poetry is the best way available to you to affirm this truth. Now, we start to see how the trap is sprung, how it was sprung and all before you were born, mind under your arm, in the poetry market that exists despite the spontaneous wailings of the poets who believe there must be no market because they cannot afford that which they should not have to pay for. The action is social, but the market exists as the secret police exists, though the market will never send you to jail for your poems, though we all believed in private that we were worth jailing for the terrible sedition of our dithyrams, believed we deserve this honor in a no passeron todos somos pussy riot sort of way, but the good reader geared for riot cometh not for us. The world of the poem is the world. The world is abstract and real. The poem fails just when it is victorious because one cannot live the absolute of victory over the sun until one can. And we do. And many will die when this happens. Poetry will be renewed in the blood of the negative and dreadfully much else. All right, let me pull up another one. I have one more. This is a shorter one. Let's see if we can get this started. Y you can read as many as I want. No, <laughs> two, is, two, is, two is all the embarrassment I can handle. This is a, this is a love poem. Uh, it's called My Life in the New Millennium. I'm waiting for the scroll to begin. <laughs> My life in the new millennium. It was true that the more I hated people, the more I loved cats. Then people started to surprise me. Often this involved fire or 
Coca-Cola bottles with petrol, which amounts to the same thing. Once fire is the form of the spectacle, the problem becomes how to set fire to fire. Some friends were prepared to help with this, which Michael Jackson having died, and then Whitney Houston was the new pop music. Without an understanding of the world system and the underlying truth of land as the place of politics and the sea as the space of commerce, it is hard to integrate that other most significant fact of our era, pirates. My friends and pirates and cats, it comes down to comrades known and elsewhere. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, That's, I'm very honored for you to read your poetry. Well, it's very generous of you to invite me to. So, two more questions if you don't mind. Absolutely. And that is, um, Talk to the youth, talk to the ones in their 20s right now. Those who are soul searching, they are wandering the dark alleys of their souls to find out who they are and how they fit into this society through your spoken words and poetry. Talk to them? Yes. I'd much rather they talk to me. I've been uh, struggling for the, the, this cycle of struggle as we often the phrase we often use, began for me in 2009. There was all the anti-war struggles around 2003 that I'm sure uh, you'll recall. They failed rather catastrophically. Uh, this current round of struggles began for me in 2009, struggling in the university and in, against police violence in the Bay Area. Uh, and in that period, I've had a chance to fight with mostly people younger than myself. My closest comrades are in their 30s, often 20s, uh, couple in, a couple in their 40s my age. Uh, and I've spent the last several years learning from them and watching them figure things out that it took me 20 years to figure out and watching them figure it out in six months. Uh, so I don't really want to speak to them. I want them to uh, speak to me and to continue with the process of figuring these things out. And as I keep saying, and will be happy to keep saying, to figure them out within struggle, I wouldn't want a 25-year-old antagonist to step back from that and really get her shit together and pull her theory together. I think that you figure that out while you're fighting, uh, you know, days of struggle, nights of understanding, early mornings of love, and back to it. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping for. And then talk to the rest of us. Talk to the ones who were the old fighters who, 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 have, who don't see the light anymore. Talk to all. Uh, <laughs> you have far too much faith in my capacities. I mean, uh, I'd like to think there's a place for the old fighters. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that place is. Again, I hope that we don't get a simple split where the, the older fighters feel like it's their task to hang back and pass on their wisdom. Uh, you know, fuck wisdom. I think that it is important to have a kind of continuity. One of the things that's been very noticeable to me, I'll tell you a little allegory, uh, is that I live in Berkeley, which is where UC Berkeley is, and I teach in Davis, which is where UC Davis is. Now Davis is a much smaller community all around. It's, it's quite different from Berkeley. Uh, so one thing that happens in both universities is students cycle through, you know, every four years, the way, it, the way it works here. And there's not a lot of political memory, and so students often have to relearn the same lessons that, that, that their fellow students learned a couple of years before. Don't invite the media into your occupation. Don't make the mistake of imagining the police are decent people. And these have to be debated every time, but more so in Davis, because in Berkeley, not that the students are any cannier or wiser, but there's also a political community in Berkeley which is not identical to the university. 
but which preserves a certain amount of this knowledge and this intensity and this antagonism. And so the lessons don't have to be relearned quite as deeply or quite as often. Uh, so I think there is a real uh, virtue. We all need to be like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Memento, where there's a guy who can't preserve his memories. And so he's writing himself notes and getting tattoos on his body to, to remember certain things. And I think that we as a movement need to realize the risk of being like that character and not being able to preserve memories. And just get these tattoos that say, you know, the police are always wrong. They will never be on your side. The corporate media will never do a story that is sympathetic to you no matter what they tell you. Do not invite them in. Do not let them into your, t like seize territory, take it, and do not let these people in. That's of course not the struggle against capitalism itself. The state in the form of the police and the media are somewhat different. But these are basic lessons that I hope people can hold on to as they increasingly take space and prepare for larger and larger struggles. The last, the last words are yours, whatever you want to say. Uh, fuck May 68, fight now. That's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.